Tonight, thousands of band members were left freezing in the dark. Now their leaders want the federal government to put some warmth in providing much-needed help. If it was cold or minus 20 or minus 30 weather, you could not wait 72 hours to address the emergency. He said, you can try fit my shoes, but they're very big, but you can... You can try my moccasins instead. Students and teachers of the Cree language at the First Nations University bid farewell to a loved and respected educator. So having this job, I, I, I even hesitate calling it a job because a job sounds uh, sometimes. But And a former APTN news reporter has an interesting new job in Nunavut. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. We begin with an update to a story we brought you yesterday. The family of a three-year-old who was stabbed in his sleep says it's likely that the boy will not survive. Here's Brittany Hobson. A community comes together to embrace a grieving mother. More than 100 people gathered outside Winnipeg's Children's Hospital to show their love and support to the family of a three-year-old who was brutally attacked two days ago. They're very distraught and something like what, what has happened to a hunter. They're lost in words. If they don't know, their heart is hurting and I, our heart is hurting with them. Hunter Strait Smith was stabbed multiple times at a home in the North End Wednesday morning. He has been in hospital in critical condition since then. Daryl Contois the is a spokesperson there, for the like, family. Like, he has sat with them during this ordeal. My heart broke when I was beside him. You know, uh, I too have kids. And, you know, to see, to see a baby laying there that did no harm to no one really broke my heart. Contois says the family is preparing to take the child off of life support. His uh, MRI scan, you know, it was the outlook was not good. At the vigil, Contois shared memories of Hunter. He was very talkative. He always asked questions. Out of the blue, he would ask you anything, like, but and he always had a smile. Angeline Flett organized the event. She didn't know the family before this week, but reached out to offer her support. She says the vigil is a chance for others to show their support as well. I think that uh, for everybody to come together in a circle and center themselves and talk about it, that's the only way we're going to get through this. Police have charged Daniel Jensen with attempted murder. Certainly if an individual passes away as a result of an assault, we'll look at upgrading charges. Jensen was previously in a relationship with Hunter's mother. Police say the accused assaulted the mother early Wednesday morning in a different location before going to the North End home to attack Hunter. Brittany Hobson, APTN National News, Winnipeg. At this time, the family is gathering at his bedside, preparing to take the child off life support. We'll have the latest on his condition on Monday. We want to hear what you think. Here's how you can continue the conversation. You can send your emails to news at aptn.ca. You can find us online at aptnnews.ca and on youtube.com slash aptnnews. You can also follow APTN News on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for more Indigenous news. Grassroots climate leaders in Ottawa today urged the new Liberal minority government to move quickly on climate action. Organizers told party leaders to set aside their differences and unite to address the climate crisis. They also said that policies need to align with the latest scientific reports and that public tax money should be directed away from fossil fuels. Catherine Abreu of uh, Climate Action Network Canada said that Indigenous people should be included in these climate solutions. Part of doing better is fully implementing the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and a core piece of it is free prior informed consent. So actually seeking um, genuine conversations with Indigenous communities about what they uh, want to see moving forward and waiting for that consent before anything does move forward. 
Three weeks ago, a massive snowstorm slammed Manitoba's Interlake region north of Winnipeg. Hundreds of hydro poles were knocked down and half a dozen First Nations had to be evacuated. Five of those chiefs were in Ottawa today to express concerns over the emergency response. They spoke to Indigenous services about having to wait 72 hours before a state of emergency could be declared and the lack of help to evacuate vulnerable citizens and pay for their care. Chief Glenn Hudson of Peguis compared their treatment to what happened during the flood of 2011. So there's if it was cold or minus 20 or minus 30 weather, you could not wait 72 hours to address the emergency. So there's their policies have to change. And again, if you look at 2011, all of our communities still have issues dating back to the 2011 flood. That's eight years later. They made commitments back then. I actually have a ministerial letter from uh, Minister uh, Strahl back then, and it still remains unfulfilled. Last week, a group of 15 youth from across the country filed a lawsuit against the federal government over what they feel is an inadequate response to the climate crisis. The youth, who range in age from 10 to 19 years old, allege the government has violated their charter rights to life, liberty and security. We're joined now by one of those teens, 19-year-old Sophia Sedaris. She's Mi'kmaq and a member of the Meta Penegag First Nation in New Brunswick. She lives in Gatineau, Quebec now, and she joins us from our Ottawa Bureau. We're also joined by Stephen Cornish, the CEO of the David Suzuki Foundation, which is supporting the youth in their lawsuit. Sophia, let's begin with you. How do you feel that the government is infringing on your charter rights, and why is a lawsuit the way to address that? I think there needs to be um, different levels of action that needs to be taken place and I think the youth wanted to be heard so a lawsuit is um, directly asking the government to take action and we're asking for a science-based recovery plan based on the best available science. And can you tell us a little bit of the way, a, a few of the ways that uh, some of the youth involved in this lawsuit feel that their lives have been impacted by climate change? Yeah, so a few of the other plaintiffs, one has uh, Lyme disease, the other one has asthma, and I think there were a few other health implications that uh, the youth plaintiffs had. So um, we're all impacted various ways. I'm not impacted um, by my health, but definitely my uh, cultural ability to practice my culture. So like um, practicing fishing for salmon and uh, the salmon is almost extinct now because of the low levels and so is the moose. So my cultural ways have been uh, infringed. Stephen, how and why did the David Suzuki Foundation get involved in this? Well, we've been absolutely uh, humbled to get involved in this and to help lift up these uh, 15 young people from across the country. They're from uh, Maritimes to the West Coast all the way up to, uh, to the North and, uh, and we feel that it's time that Canadians heard from uh, these young leaders to know that climate change is affecting them today. And we believe all Canadians would want to protect their health, their livelihoods, and, and their security going into the future. And we're just not seeing enough change. We're seeing small steps being taken when we need big steps. This, this past year, we were told by the International Panel on Climate Change, we had 10 years to turn things around mm -hmm. and we're still seeing dithering so we believe that we have to take this movement from the streets to the courts to be able to set a real ceiling uh, and get us on track. And what would a victory mean uh, in this case then Stephen if, if you guys are successful where, where do we go from there? Well what it would mean is that the courts would set uh, a target according to science and, and say to the government that they have to set a climate remediation plan. And this would then depoliticize the issue, it would no longer be partisan, it wouldn't be left or right, it would just be a human rights issue. And then all successive governments would have to take the types of measures we need to see in order to guarantee the future for our children and for future generations to come. And last question to you, Sophia, what would a victory mean to you uh, if, if you guys are successful? I think a victory would mean that uh, the courts take us seriously and that this is a serious issue that my generation is being impacted on and uh, we, de we demand action. I thank you guys both very much for joining us. This is very interesting. We'll be watching this as it winds its way through the courts. Thank you.
Thanks for following this story. It's very important. It's time for us to take a quick break, but we've got lots more news still ahead, so stay with us. Starting off in the East Coast, we've got 6 in Sunshine in Fredericton, 7 and Sunny in St. John's. Happy Valley Goose Bay will be snowing in 2 degrees, Kujawak minus 5 and clear skies. Shibugu Moose snow minus 1, uh, Quebec City 3 degrees and sunny. Sault Ste. Marie will be snowy 3 degrees, Ottawa snow in 5. Zero and snow for Sioux Lookout Campus Casing, snow in 2 degrees, same with Timmins. Minus 1 and snow in Churchill and God's Lake, plus 1 and snow in the Paw. Two and mostly sunny skies in Gimli, mix of sun and cloud in two in Winnipeg and Brandon. Swift Current will be two and snowy, same with Regina, three with mix of sun and cloud in Saskatoon. Minus two and snow in Uranium City, one and snow in Buffalo Narrows, and mix of sun and cloud in three degrees for Meadow Lake. Welcome back to Iqaluit Now, where our Kent Driscoll managed to track down one of the biggest stars in Inuit fil film and television. The thing is that it wasn't actually that hard to find her because she used to be one of us at, here at APTN News. Malaya Kronik Chapman walked through the door of the APTN National News Iqaluit studio in 2011. As the subject of a story, she had been named Miss Nunavut and was competing nationally in a pageant. A year later, she was working here. Not the subject of stories, but as a storyteller. That's how I met her. She now lives in Kujuak, Nunavik. And what a road to get there. While doing news, she turned a bit part in the IBC Inuktitut comedy show, Ken Early, into a starring role. After she left us, she produced a movie shown all over the world, based on her own life story. If I had a gun, I would catch that seal. Where? I didn't even see it. Over there. Would you eat it? Of course. We caught up earlier this week. I took her to meet the film club at Anukshuk High School in Halloween. We put the students to work, too. First, we wanted to know about her current show on the Inuit Broadcasting Corporation. The show is called Nunavut Mamariyavut, which translates to the food we love in Nunavut. And the base of the show is really exploring Inuit food, and not in like an incredible cuisine kind of way, but more taking it back. The show is an ideal fit for Malaya. She loves making film and TV, and she absolutely loves Nunavut's food. I was going to ask, no one loves country food more than you do, in my experience. <laughs> How much fun are you having going and being fed all over the territory? It literally is a dream job because I... I don't know anyone that loves food more than I do as well. So having this job, I, I, I even hesitate calling it a job because a job sounds uh, sometimes, but this, I get to travel to the communities and I get to go hunting and I get to eat it. Her current project is her most ambitious. She's one of the stars in a feature film set in Nunavik, Restless River. This is during the time that the Americans were living in Kujuak and occupying the space and uh, things happen along the storyline that tell the whole feature film. In eight years, Malaya has gone from rookie reporter to feature film star. Her advice to any young Inuk who wants to follow her path? Keep going. You can't stop. If this is something that interests you, you know, you're going to have hard days. That's life. But if you really want it, do it. Kent Driscoll, APTN National News, Halloween. Cape Dorset, Nunavut, has been producing world-class Inuit art for almost 60 years. Kent Driscoll spent some time recently in the small Nunavut community of 1,400 people and visited a new facility with a lot of history. The artistic roots of Cape Dorset aren't hard to find. Just look around. This is the community hall with its own unique look. This is the old print shop. You can tell a community is filled with artists when even the safety signs are telling a story. The new cultural center opened a few months ago. It looks a little plain from the outside, but inside? Well, see for yourself. The center is named for Kanujuak Ashiba. Oh, let's put it this way. If you only know one piece of Inuit art, it is likely hers, and it's probably this one. Enchanted Owl hangs here at the center, and it's also been made into a postage stamp. Louisa Parr runs the cultural center and co-curated the Ashivak exhibit. She has artists on both sides of her family. She even knew Ashivak when she was younger. She was extraordinary. 
um, she was very kind. She's never had anything bad to say about anybody. Uh, you know, she was kind of old-fashioned, but, you know, also very famous. Uh. Make no mistake, this is a world-class facility, a thing Nunavut has very few of, and Parr appreciates that fact. It's amazing. It's been a dream for, for a long time now. Um, I remember my grandfather kind of talking about it when I was younger uh, and when he was alive, right? So to actually see it up and running is amazing. It's a dream come true. Ashivak's original drawings hang here, and so are the color prints that her fellow Dorset artists made stand out. The exhibition we have out right now is never before seen. They were never before seen before the opening. So when West Baff and Eskimo Co-op bought them, they went into archives, into Toronto uh, Dorset Fine Arts, which is another office for West Baff and Eskimo Co-op. Edition numbered prints in Cape Dorset for 59 years. But this year, with this cultural at center opening, there's enough space to display this Inuit art in the Inuit community that created it. And the cultural center gives the next generation of Inuit artists a place to appreciate the previous ones. Kent Driscoll, APTN National News, Cape Dorset. A well-known educator of the Cree language is being remembered for his knowledge and dedication to culture. Darren Okamasum recently passed away after a long battle with cancer, but even when times were tough, he continued to do what he loved, teaching hundreds of students at the First Nations University in Regina. CTV's Kreesin Ajakode has more on this countless contributions. Staff at the First Nations University of Canada are remembering Cree language instructor, professor and author Darren Okamasum. He was a wonderful person, um, loved by the community, an incredibly gifted language teacher. He knew how to speak the language. He knew how to write the language, knew how, how to teach, and he knew how to translate, you know, all those four things, you know. I wish we had more people like that. Oka Mason was a Cree instructor for more than three decades at the First Nations University, teaching introductory Cree courses. He would go on to instruct in many communities across the province. Solomon Rat is a colleague and friend who worked alongside Oka Mason. He says he always put his heart into teaching the language to the students. To be able to look at the grammar, to recognize the grammar, and to explain the grammar to other people that are, who are learning. In 2011, Oka Mason was diagnosed with stage 4 colorectal cancer and he was told he only had six months to a year and a half to live. He then underwent chemotherapy and pushed on teaching for many more years while always keeping his humor close. Primary tumor was removed from my colon and eight inches of my colon so you could say I have a semicolon. <laughs> Pardon me. He always said you should major in Cree. Destiny Thomas credits Oka Mason for deciding to switch her major from social work to Cree. She now plans to teach and carry on the language in his honor. He said you can try fit my shoes but they're very big but you can you can try my moccasins instead. At only 53 years old, Oka Mason lost his battle with cancer on Wednesday, but his memory and the language will live on through students like Thomas. Oka Mason will be laid to rest at his home First Nation of Beardies and Okamasa's Cree Nation on Saturday. From the bottom of my heart, I give you all respect. Thank you. Cree Sinatchkate, CTV News, Regina. It's time for us to take another break, but when we come back, would-be robbers found out the hard way not to mess with people's bingo. Stay with us. Off to northern Alberta, we've got zero and snow in Fort Fort Chip, six and rain in Grand Prairie. Six in a mix of sun and cloud in Edmonton, eight with rain in Calgary and Lethbridge. Twelve in sunshine for Campbell River, eight rain in Quinell. Four with a mix of sun and cloud in Fort Nelson, 11 and rain for Sandspit. Minus two and snow for Dawson City, minus one and snow for Mayo. Minus 10, mostly sunny skies in Norman Wells, minus three in Fort Simpson with a mix of sun and cloud. Saks Harbor, minus 17 in clear skies. Tuck is snowing and minus four. Tw minus 25 in Cambridge Bay, clear skies. Minus 19 up in Repulse Bay and mostly clear. 
Arctic Bay, minus 12 with a mix of sun and cloud. Minus 17 for Goya Haven and snow. Minus 3 and mostly sunny skies for Iqaluit. Welcome back. An all-new episode of APTN Investigates airs tonight right after the national news. Host a uh, Dennis Ward spoke with reporter Tamara Pimentel earlier about her documentary, Part 2 of Membership Denied. Good to see you. How does Part 2 of Membership Denied follow up on, on Part 1? So Part 1 um, gives us a background on the Sauvage First Nation. It's a wealthy band with just over 40 members. And it gives us a background on some of the characters we meet and why they or how they tried to become a member of Sarge but weren't able to get membership. Uh, part two kind of digs deeper into how Bill C-31 of the Indian Act affects things like, like membership and how uh, Section 10 bands like Sawridge um, have a lot of issues with membership because they have control over their own membership list and how that affects some of their members. What were some of the concerns you uncovered? So in part two, we hear from Catherine Twin, and something that she says is, uh, we're responsible for our own termination. And then she goes on to say that out of the 40 so band members that are living on Saw Ridge, only one of them is a child. So I think the biggest concern for everyone we spoke to is what will happen with the future of Saw Ridge and what, what's gonna happen with their children's future are they going to grow up with a community? Are they going to grow up with their culture and their traditions that a lot of their parents didn't really get to, to learn from? Well, looking forward to part two, Tamara. Thanks for taking some time to talk to us about it. Thank you. A couple of would-be robbers learned the hard way not to interrupt bingo when the crowd turned on them undeterred by a shotgun. It happened at a North End Winnipeg bingo hall on Halloween night. A teenage boy and a woman entered the hall and allegedly sprayed a 70-year-old bingo worker with what's believed to be bear spray or something similar. One of them then grabbed the cash tray and attempted to take off, but several bingo players were having none of it and intervened. The female suspect attempted to flee uh, ha after having grabbed the cash tray. However, her escape was interrupted by patrons and it caused her to drop the tray. The male youth was caught and restrained by patrons. The female suspect fled the premises with a firearm but was disarmed prior to escaping, so she continued to flee. A loaded 22 caliber shotgun was seized at the scene. A 38-year-old woman and a 17-year-old male face a slew of charges in connection with the attempted robbery. And that is all the news that I have for you this Friday. I'm Melissa Ridgen, and I'll see you back here tomorrow for your APTN News Weekend. Have a great night.